In this lecture, we look at rectangular waveguide. And the concept of a waveguide, as the name implies, refers to a structure that guides a wave. So typically, we've got some field at point A, and we want to get it over to point B. And so we have some structure that guides the field. And that usually means gets as much of the power as possible from point A to point B in as useful a form as possible. And a rectangular waveguide would then be a waveguide that does that with a structure that has a rectangular cross section. And so we'll assume that that cross section is as follows. Here's the X and Y and the Z axis, it comes out of the page. We have a rectangular cross section that has a width A and a height B, and that extends infinitely far in the Z direction. like so, it goes back, back to minus infinity that direction and plus infinity in that direction. And so we're gonna look at the case where the fields are propagating essentially in the plus Z direction. So it has a phase factor, e to the minus j, beta Z, Z. And then we gotta figure out the dependence on X and Y inside this structure, which we'll assume as sides which are made of PEC material, so PEC sides. So that creates boundary conditions. You look at a cross section, Z is equal to a constant. Here's our rectangular wave guide cross section. X goes from zero to A and Y from zero to B. And at a PEC surface, the tangential components of the electric field have to vanish, right? And we can have EX, EY, and EZ components. So here's the X direction, there's Y, and Z then comes out of the board. So EZ will be tangential at all four of these surfaces, left, right, top, and bottom. So it has to vanish at all four of those surfaces. Whereas EX, for example, is tangential only on the top and bottom surfaces, and EY is tangential only on the left and right surfaces. So our boundary conditions become, on the bottom, we need EX is equal to EZ is equal to zero, and likewise on the top, and on the left and right, we need EY is equal to EZ is equal to zero. And those form our boundary conditions that we need to enforce. In that then, given this assumed Z dependence, that should then fix the X and Y dependence of our field components. Now, as we've developed in this course, um, we're going to use the idea of breaking things up into TEZ and TMZ parts, because we know that we can represent an arbitrary electromagnetic field as a superposition of a TEZ field, which can be described just by an Fz of x, y, and z, a z component of the electric vector potential, and the tmz, which can be described as an az of x, y, and z, a z component of the magnetic vector potential. And we're going to analyze these two cases separately. And we'll see that for this type of structure, we actually get full solutions that are either tez or tmz. And we'll get families of solutions indexed by integers 
And we'll call these the TEZ and TMZ modes of the waveguide. And we'll see that one particular mode forms what we call the dominant mode. It's the mode that for these types of purposes of getting energy from point A to point B tends to be the most useful. We'll start off um, assuming that we have perfect electrically conducting sides and work out all the field components and the pointing vector and the total power carried by the waveguide and so on. And then at the end, we'll look at the case of, well, what if we have a good conductor but not a perfect conductor? Well, then we're going to get some ohmic losses, and we can use the idea of surface resistance that we developed in previous lecture to attack that problem and figure out the losses per, uh, in, in watts per meter as we propagate along this waveguide. Now, we need solutions for the, the fields in the waveguide. Those fields must satisfy the Helmholtz equation. And we know that in rectangular coordinates, we can have solutions of the Helmholtz equation that would look like e to the plus or minus j beta xx, and we could have a factor e to the plus or minus j beta yy, and we want explicitly to have e to the minus j beta z z for the z dependence. And we could have any linear combinations of those, and those will be a solution provided beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared, which is omega squared mu epsilon. Now, these factors, e to the plus or minus j, beta x, x, etc., of course have a magnitude which is always equal to 1. And we want the fields to vanish at the surface of the PEC waveguide, at least the electric fields to vanish there. And so it probably is more in our interest to take linear combinations of these, like e to the j beta xx plus e to the minus j beta xx, which is 2 cosine beta xx, or e to the j beta xx minus e to the minus j beta xx, which is 2j sine beta xx, because the, of course, the sine and the cosine have zeros. So there's no loss in generality in using linear combinations of the sine and cosine as opposed to linear combinations of e to the plus or minus j beta xx, etc. So we're going to look now at the TEZ solutions. And we'll represent this as, right, this is going to be f is equal to az hat, uh, some function, f uh, z of x, y, and explicitly has e to the minus j beta z, z dependence, which we'll take to be as follows. We'll take our f z to look like this, f0, and these brackets are going to represent an arbitrary linear combination of the two functions we put inside. So we'll have cosine beta xx and sine beta xx. So that means an arbitrary linear combination of those two functions. And then we'll do the same thing in y. Cosine beta y y and the sine beta y y. And of course we have then our e to the minus j beta z z for our z component of f z let's put a tilde there this is a different this this guy includes the the z dependence okay so that's the form we're going to assume they have to satisfy the beta x beta y and beta z has to satisfy this uh, pythagorean sum there 
Uh, and then we need to meet the boundary conditions. So how do we get those boundary conditions? We go and we go back to our vector potential lecture, and we look at what happens if you have a Z component of the electric vector potential, what are the field components? Well, the field components are the electric field is EX is equal to minus one over epsilon, the y derivative of fz, um, ey is plus one over epsilon, the x derivative of fz, and ez is equal to zero. hx is one over j omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to x and z of fz. hy is 1 over j omega u epsilon. The second derivative with respect to y and z of fz. And hz is minus 1 over j omega mu epsilon times the second derivative with respect to x of fz plus the second derivative with respect to y of fz. Now, in order to figure out what the beta x and beta y and beta z values can be, we need, uh, in addition, for them to satisfy this relationship here, figure out what values they need to take on so that the EX, EY, and EZ are zero at the appropriate boundaries. And let's just redraw that here. Here's our little rectangular cross section. Here's X and Y, and this is zero to A, zero to B, and Y. So we need EZ to be zero everywhere, but uh, it already is because this is a TEZ mode. And so what we need to focus on then is that EX and the top and bottom must be zero and EY on the left and right must be zero. So what will EX be? EX is going to be minus one over epsilon times, we got this uh, constant F0, which we'll just bring out, F0. And then we're going to take a Y derivative of FZ. So a Y derivative is going to affect this term here. Let's see, in the chain rule, in both cases, we'll bring out a factor of beta Y. We'll put that right there. So it won't affect the first X factor, so we'll have the same linear combination there that we had for our FZ. But when we take a y derivative of this, well, cosine goes to minus the sine. Again, the chain rule would bring out the factor of beta y, and sine goes to cosine. And then we've got the same z dependence. And that's got to be equal to zero, where at y is equal to zero, that's the bottom, and y is equal to b. So how can we get that to be equal to zero at, a different, at various values of y? Well, it will be determined by this y dependence factor here. So for this to be zero at y is equal to zero, let's see, well, cosine of zero is one, so that's not zero, so we can't have that. Sine of zero is zero, so that works. Okay, so we can't have the cosine in the EX. We've got to have the sine. But the sine came from the cosine term in the FZ. We've got to have the cosine in the FZ. When we do the Y derivative, that gives us a sine, and that vanishes at Y is equal to zero. Now, to vanish at Y is equal to B, what do we need to have? So we need to have... Now, the sine of beta y b has to be equal to zero. And we can get that 
by setting beta y is equal to some integer n times pi over b, where n could be 0 or 1 or 2, and etc. Because then beta y times b would just be n pi, and sine n pi is equal to 0 for any integer value of n, including 0. If, if n was equal to 0, beta y would be 0, and then up here, cosine of beta y would just be 1. So that, that's acceptable. Okay, so that would give us our boundary conditions at the top and bottom faces. What is ey? ey is 1 over epsilon. We'll bring out our factor f0 here. We're going to take an x derivative of fz, so the x derivative is going to operate on this factor. Chain rule will bring out a beta x factor, beta x, and the cosine will, the derivative will be minus the sine, and the sine, the derivative will be the cosine. And we'll have the same y linear combination as we had in fz, and the same e to the minus j beta z z. So this has the vanish at the left and right faces. That's y is equal to, uh, I'm sorry, x is equal to 0, and x is equal to a, left and right faces. So ey has to, to vanish. So that's going to be determined by this x factor here. So that's got to be 0 at x is equal to 0. So, right, so this has got to be equal to 0 at x is equal to 0 and a. So by the same argument we use for the, the y factor, we can't have cosine term. But if we go back to the fz, that cosine came from this sine term, so we can't have that. We've got to use the two cosine factors for our fz. And that'll get us that this will disappear when x is equal to 0. Now to get it to vanish at x is equal to a, so we need then sine beta x a is equal to 0. Well, we'll take beta x to be an integer m times pi over a, and m could be 0, 1, 2, and so on. So, with those arguments, here is our solution. Fz is F0 cosine m pi over ax cosine m pi over by e to the minus j beta z z and ex is f0 times beta y which is n pi over b uh, over epsilon so b epsilon cosine m pi over ax times the sine of n pi over by z dependence and ey is minus f0 beta x which is m pi over a and then there's an one over epsilon sine m pi over ax cosine n pi over by e to the minus j beta z z where m can be 0 or 1 or 2 or any non-negative integer and n can be any non-negative integer 
But a quick check here, and of course, EZ is identically equal to zero. It's a TEZ mode. A quick check shows that if we have, for example, M is equal to zero, well then, sine of M times something is zero, so the EY goes away. That's okay, because the EX is still there. But if we also had N is equal to zero, well then the sine of N times something would go away, and all of the electric field would disappear. So we can't have M and N both equal to zero. One can be zero, but not both. And then those would be the electric fields. Now, so this fix is right, our beta x is m pi over a, our beta y is n pi over b. And what fixes our beta z? Our beta z is fixed by the fact that um, beta x squared, which is m pi over a squared, plus beta y squared, which is n pi over b squared, plus beta z squared, it's got to be equal to beta squared, which is omega squared mu epsilon. And we can turn that around and solve that for beta z. So we'll write beta z, uh, not squared, but beta z, we'll take a square root, right? solve for beta z squared and take a square root. So that'll be beta squared, which is omega squared mu epsilon minus m pi over a squared minus n pi over b squared, square root of all of that. And that, that then would define a solution. Now looking at this uh, beta z expression here, we can see that we'll get in trouble if for a fixed value of the frequency, m and or n get really big, because then we got some positive number minus a really big negative number, and that difference could then become negative. And we'd have a square root of a negative number, that'd become imaginary. And now we'd have beta z itself would become imaginary, and we get things like uh, e to the minus j times minus j alpha z times z would be like an, you'd get something like this, so that beta z, that was minus, say, minus j alpha z, then e to the minus j beta zz becomes minus j squared is minus one, so minus alpha z, z, and it no longer propagates. And that is what we call the cutoff effect. So if the frequency is not high enough, then that particular mn mode will be in cutoff. In other words, it won't propagate anymore. Uh, so to, to not be in cutoff, we'd have to make sure the frequency was high enough so that this thing under the square root sign is positive. So that leads to the idea of a cutoff frequency. So from the argument of that square root, we're going to define omega c, cutoff frequency in radians per second, such that omega c squared u epsilon is equal to m pi over a squared plus n pi over b squared. And at that frequency, beta z will be equal to zero because it will be the square root of this minus this. So square root of zero is zero. And that defines the cutoff frequency. And we often use the fact that omega, of course, is 2 pi times f, where f is in hertz, and omega is in radians per second. And we can more conveniently represent then the cutoff frequency f sub c, and explicitly is a function of these integers m and n. So we'll write f sub c m n as 1 over 2 pi square root of mu epsilon. times the square root of m pi over a squared plus n pi over b squared. 
And that is the for the T E Z M N mode. That is the cutoff frequency. It means that that mode cannot propagate at a frequency less than or equal to that value. It has to be at a frequency greater than that value. If you go down below that frequency, then you go into cutoff, and then instead of propagating, it decays exponentially in Z. So with that definition, we can now write our expression for beta Z as the square root of omega squared mu epsilon, and it would be minus these terms, but those are now can be represented as minus omega C squared mu epsilon. Factor out uh, an omega square root mu epsilon from inside here. Actually, factor out an omega squared mu epsilon, and then the square root of that becomes this. So factor that out, and that leaves 1 minus omega c over omega squared inside the square root. And we can furthermore write this as, let's see, omega square root mu epsilon, that's beta. And then, of course, just dividing out two pi factors on numerator and denominator there, that could also be written as 1 minus fc over f squared. So that's an alternate form for the, the beta z is a function of frequency. And <clears throat> notice clearly here, when f goes to fc, when we go to the cutoff frequency, beta, beta z goes to zero. And of course, as, if f is less than fc, then this is a square root of a negative number, then beta z becomes imaginary. And if f is greater than fc, then it's positive. All right, so with that, now we've got our complete solution. Choose particular values of these integers m and n. Calculate the cutoff frequency. And then for a given operating frequency, this gives you your beta z. And of course, those m and n fix the beta x and the beta, beta y. And then we go back and just plug into our expressions for the fz the, and the ex and ey and, and also for hxy and z. Um, and so those are ex is equal to uh, the constant. We called it f0, but now I'm going to call it fmn because it's specific to this mn mode. And we've got uh, our beta um, y over epsilon, and beta y is uh, n pi over b, and so then times epsilon. And we've got cosine m pi over a x sine n pi over b y. And then everything out here is going to have an e to the minus j beta z z. I'll put that in in a minute. And for e y, we've got minus f m n it's got a beta x factor which is pi m over a and then also one over epsilon cosine uh i'm sorry sine so it has an x derivative of m pi over a x cosine n pi over b y and e z is identically equal to zero and these all have a factor of e to the minus j beta z z so those are the x and y components of the electric field now for the magnetic field you use the appropriate formulas for those, and they work out to be hx is f m n pi m beta z 
over omega mu epsilon a sine m pi over a x cosine n pi over b y and they're going to have the same z factor h y is f m n pi n beta z over omega mu epsilon b cosine of m pi over a x sine of n pi over b y and h z is minus j f m n omega c squared over omega cosine m pi over a x cosine n pi over b y and those all have an e to the minus j beta z z factor so just to check our electric field the ex has the vanish at the top and bottom surface that's y is equal to zero and b and indeed it does right because it's either sine of zero or sine or n pi and ey has got to vanish on the left and right faces that's at x equals zero or a and that that indeed does vanish notice another interesting thing here uh, if we look at ex and hy they have the same spatial dependence the cosine sine and if we look at ey and h x they also have the same spatial dependence sine cosine and so that means they are multiples of each other so that if we take for example uh, so ey and hx there's a minus sign so if we take ey over minus hx what do we get well the sine and the cosine cancels the fmn cancels let's see pi m over a all, all cancels and all that leaves is a beta z over omega mu okay so we take the, the ratio of this over this um sorry it's in the other other direction omega mu over beta z for the way we've written it there Okay, so we divide this by that. Everything had cancel except for the beta z over omega mu. What about if you took uh, ex over hy? Uh, let's see, you got pi n over b that cancels. Everything cancels except, again, the omega mu over beta z. So this is also equal to ex over hy. Right, and this leads us to define an impedance for that particular mode in terms of this constant. So we define the wave impedance as Z is equal to omega mu over beta z and the wave impedance right what is that it's just the ratio of, of an electric field component to its orthogonal magnetic field component partner and um, using our formula for beta z we can re-express this as eta over the square root of one minus fc over f squared or eta is our root mu over epsilon the characteristic impedance of the material that fills the waveguide and so using that wave impedance concept just like we did for oblique incidence we can do 
uh, reflection and transmission problems inside a waveguide with the same kind of formulas for reflection and transmission coefficients. So we've solved for the PZMN modes. Now, let's go back to the cutoff frequency for the M nth mode, one over two pi square root u epsilon, square root of M pi over a squared plus n pi over b squared. And as m and or n get bigger, that cutoff frequency gets bigger. So what is the lowest possible cutoff frequency? Let's see, we cannot have both m and n be zero, we said. So we could have m is equal to one and n is equal to zero or we could have m is equal to zero and n is equal to one. And we're assuming that a is greater than b so that we orient our waveguide so that the long edge is along the x-axis. So a is bigger than b, so one over a is smaller than one over b. So the m equals one, n equals zero case would give us, give us a smaller value than the m equals zero, n equals one case. So that would give us the lowest cutoff frequency would be the FC10 cutoff would be one over the square root, uh, I'm sorry, one over two pi times the square root mu epsilon. And then we would just have square root of pi over a squared. So that would just be then pi up here, which would cancel that pi there and leave us with an a down below. And so that would be the cutoff frequency of that particular mode, the TEZ10 mode, which we could also rewrite as, um, because 1 over square root of mu0 zero, epsilon0 zero is the speed of light, C, we could write this as C over 2A, and then square root mu relative epsilon relative. Other way to write that. All uh, other modes, TEZ modes, are going to have a higher cutoff frequency. And in fact, the, the next highest one would be this m is equal to zero, n is equal to one mode. So if we operate our waveguide with frequencies between this TEZ10 uh, mode and the next highest cutoff, which is the zero one then we will have, at least for TEZ modes, what we call single mode operation. We'll have only this one particular mode. We're going to call that the dominant mode. We'll see later that uh, for the TMZ modes, none of them has a cutoff frequency that is it falls in this region. So indeed, this is the dominant mode for the waveguide as a whole. If we keep our frequencies in a certain range, we can ensure that only this one particular mode can propagate in the waveguide, and that can be very useful. And that's the most common way to use a waveguide. So in that case, we might ask, well, what are, what are the purpose of knowing about these higher order modes? And we'll see in the next lecture that when we, if we want to solve more complicated problems where say we adjoin two waveguides together or we radi have a waveguide radiate out into free space or something like that, we often have to invoke these higher order modes to, to solve those more complicated problems. So um, if we just focus then on this particular dominant mode, then field vectors reduce down uh, because uh, n is equal to zero, it turns out we have no EX electric field component. We have only an EY, and we'll take the uh, coefficient of that EY to be EM, the maximum electric field amplitude. And, th and this is just 
equivalent to setting F10 to be equal to minus um, EM A epsilon over pi. And we get sine of pi over AX and an e to the minus j beta z. There's no ez or ex, there's an hx, which is minus em over that impedance, z, wave impedance, the same sine pi a over x, and there's an hz, which is j em pi over Eta beta a times a cosine pi over a x. And all three of these share an e to the minus j beta z z dependence. Now we're also typically interested in the pointing vector. Remember p is one half the real part of E cross H, and it gives us the time, oops, H conjugate, sorry. It gives us the time average intensity of the field, watts per square meter. And in this case, EY cross HZ is gonna have a factor of J, so the real part of that would go away, and we are, end up only with, this is um, EY times minus HX, and that calculates out to az hat em squared over 2z and because of the factor of two sines we get sine squared pi over a x so notice the uh, behavior here inside of our waveguide of the electric field. This is the X and Y directions. There's only an EY, and that is maximum right at the center at X is equal to A over two, because then we'd have sine pi over two is one, and that's where the value is EM, that's the maximum value. And then it decreases as we move to the left or right and gets down to zero right at the boundaries. And then HX is just that same thing, rotated 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise uh, and scaled by the impedance Z. So this is EY. And then P goes, uh, follows that as the square of that, so sine squared. If we want to know the total power propagating down the waveguide, well, we just integrate this power in watts per square meter over the total number of square meters here. Integrate from 0 to A, 0 to B, and Y, 0 to A and X, 0 to B and Y. And that's pretty easy because the average value of sine squared is 1 half. And the total area is A times B. And so you end up then just with, this is equal to A, B, em squared, and instead of over 2z, because of the average value of sine squared is a half, this is over 4z, and that's the total power carried by the waveguide. Now we'll look at the emz modes. So in this case, we have a z component of the magnetic vector potential. We'll write this as some constant times an arbitrary linear combination of cosine beta xx and sine beta xx times a linear combination of cosine beta yy and sine beta yy and then z dependence e to the minus j beta z z and so with respect to the boundary conditions we need to look at the electric field so we go back to our vector potential lecture and look up 
what the components of the electric field are in terms of AZ, and EX is minus J over omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to X and Z of AZ, EY is minus J over omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to Y and Z of AZ, and EZ is J over omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to X of AZ, plus the second derivative with respect to Y of AZ. So, looking at our boundary conditions, here's X and Y, zero to A and zero to B, and we need to have, EZ needs to vanish everywhere, and then EX at the top and bottom, and EY at the left and right. So let's look at EZ first, let's see. So it's gonna be second derivative with respect to X. So that would take cosine into minus cosine, right? Because cosine would go to minus sine and then sine would go to cosine. You get two factors of beta X, so beta X squared, but it would just get you back to cosine. You do two derivatives. Likewise, for sine, two derivatives of the sine gives you minus the sine and then chain rule brings out a beta x squared. And likewise for the y, two derivatives and y would just get you back to these original functions with a minus sign and then a, a factor of beta, beta y squared. So this has got to vanish on all four sides. So it certainly has to vanish at x is equal to zero and y is equal to zero. So that means we cannot have the cosine terms here. It has to only be the sine terms. And then that'll cause it to vanish at x is equal to zero and y is equal to zero. And then to vanish at x equals a and y is equal to a, we, as before, need to have beta x is m pi over a and beta y is n pi over b. In this case, however, because az is proportional now to the sine beta x times sine beta y, we cannot have beta x or beta y be equal to zero. That means m and n cannot be zero, so they have to start at one, then two, three, and et cetera. They have to be positive integers. Let's see if this takes care of the other boundary conditions. That takes care of EZ will vanish at all those, those boundaries. EX, a Z derivative just brings down a factor of minus J beta Z, and the X derivative would then take the sine to a cosine, and that's got to vanish at y is zero and b. Well, that doesn't affect this sine beta y, so that will vanish under these conditions, just like az will vanish. And then for ey, it has to vanish at x is equal to zero and a, and that involves a y derivative, so that'll take this sine to a cosine, but then the vanishing at x equals zero and a will be due to this factor, sine beta x, x, and that will, for all these reasons, vanish. So that is then, those are the conditions that meet our boundary conditions, and therefore AZ will write as AMN sine M pi over AX sine N pi over BY e to the minus J beta Z Z. And the relation between beta Z and M and N is the same as it was for the TEZ modes in order to have a solution of the Helmholtz equation. And the cutoff frequencies will all be the same. But notice here, M and N, neither of those can be zero. So the lowest cutoff frequency would be here, the TM11 mode, and that has a cutoff frequency that's higher than the TE10 or the TE01 mode. So again, the dominant mode is the TE10 mode. So this doesn't change anything about what we did before and in respect to uh, 
classifying that dominant mode. And so we can go through and work out using the formulas for the electric and magnetic vector, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the components from the magnetic vector potential and work out all of the H and E components. And that's done in detail uh, in the notes. Now we want to talk about ohmic losses. So, so far, we've assumed that the walls of our waveguide are PEC, right? And that would PEC would be the case where sigma conductivity goes to infinity or equivalently the imaginary part of the permittivity of the material goes to infinity. What about a finite value of sigma or epsilon double prime? Well, if sigma is finite but very large, then the PEC uh, limit is a good approximation and gives us a good approximation to what the actual fields are. And then what we can do is calculate the surface current density, use the ideas that we developed in our lectures on reflection and transmission of plane waves, where we saw that the surface current at a PEC surface is the outward unit normal across the total magnetic field. That's the surface current density. And we defined something called the surface resistance, RS, which is the square root of mu over 2 epsilon double prime. And we can convert epsilon double prime to an, uh, an effective conductivity as sigma effective is omega epsilon double prime. Or use this to calculate epsilon double prime given a sigma. And then we said that the rate of change of dissipated power for surface area, ds, is one half the surface resistance, rs, times the magnitude squared of the surface current density. So let's go ahead and do these calculations for the dominant mode, the TE10, TEZ10 mode. So we need the magnetic field. And so there are two components, two non-zero components. Hx is minus Em over the wave impedance Z sine pi over Ax e to the minus j beta Zz. And there is a Z component, which is j em pi over eta beta a cosine pi over ax e to the minus j beta z z and now let's look at our cross section of the waveguide x and y and the surface normals Outward pointing surface normals for the PEC surfaces would look like this. So, all right, this, this here would be a y hat at the lower surface, and this is a x hat. And then at the opposite surface, they point the opposite direction, they would have a minus sign. So we need to look at um, A and hat cross H. So at X is equal to zero, that's the left wall over here. We would have that JS is equal to 
what is the surface normal? It's um, AX hat cross HX zero H Z. AX hat cross AX hat is zero, so you're only going to get a contribution from, from AZ. And let's see, AX, uh, X cross H, uh, cross Z, sorry. There's X, Y, and Z. So X cross Y is Z. X cross Z is minus Y. So this would be in the minus Y direction. So it would be uh, a minus a y hat, and then just h z j e m phi over eta beta a cosine phi over a x, um, and then it would have the e to the minus j beta z z, which is going to go away when we take the magnitude squared of that. Okay, so how about on the right side? On the right side, the only difference is that the surface normal now points in the opposite direction. And let's see over here, right, the cosine. Uh, let, me, let me put in the fact that x is equal to 0 here, so the cosine is equal to 1. This just becomes 1, and then e to the minus j beta z z. So what happens when we go over here to x is equal to a? So the unit normal flips, we get a minus sign. But the cosine now of, when you put a in here, this will be cosine of pi is minus 1. So you get a minus sign from that also. So those two minus signs cancel. So that is also valid at x is equal to a. So we get the same surface current. Uh, surface current density on the left and the right walls. Now let's look at the bottom wall. At y is equal to zero. So there the surface normal is a y hat. So we'll get a y hat cross got h x zero h z. So you're going to get two non-zero terms there. You're going to get, let's see, uh, ay cross um, x is minus z. So this cross that is in the minus z direction. So we're going to get minus az hat and the hx times <clears throat> hx, but hx has a minus in it, so that'll get rid of that minus sign. Just leave it az hat, and then we'll have em, all the terms here. Um, and this is at y is equal to zero, so we still have the x dependence, sine i over ax. We'll have a e to the minus j beta z, which we'll factor out. We got that, and then we've got the ay hat cross h z let's see so y cross z is in the x direction so we'll have plus a x hat and then the h z factors here um j e m pi over eta beta a cosine pi over a x all that times e to the minus j beta z z. Now, what happens at uh, y is equal to b, the top surface now? Well, there's no y dependence anywhere in uh, of these fields. And so the only change will be that the surface normal flips from a y hat to minus a y hat. And so all these cross products will flip. We'll just have a minus sign out in front. So at y is equal to b, we just add a minus 1 factor or a minus sign. So the 
Surface currents are the opposite of what they are but down below. And so if we look at that, let's take a uh, look at what we're getting for our actual uh, surface currents on the sides. We have a constant value. Once you work out these constants here, uh, and of course there's a phase factor with respect to Z, but at a constant value of Z, let's say Z is equal to zero, you just have a constant current. It's in the negative Y direction. So you just have a current flowing down. Of course, it's very sinusoidally. So through time, it goes down and up, but at T is equal to zero and Z is equal to zero, it would be going down on both sides. And then how about the um, X component here? Let's see, cosine pi over AX. So that is zero at the center at A is A over two because cosine pi over two is zero. And so to the left, um, it would be positive. So, it would, so over here, it would be positive. And to the right of A over two, it would be negative because you'd be more than pi over two. So they would have the, so you can see what's happening here in the, uh, the X and Y currents, you got them coming down here and then coming in, coming down here, coming in. And then on the top, we'd add a minus factor, minus one factor, so they'd go in the opposite directions. So in terms of the X and Y currents, they're flowing from the top down to the bottom, and then of course they would sinusoidally vary back and forth. This is the direction of, the, of that current. For the Z components, they vary as the sine and so that starts at, at zero is a maximum in the center and then goes to zero at the end that's coming and that's coming out of the board and then when you go to the other side so that down here they would be coming out so there's there's the z component of that current and at the top they'd be going in and they'd be biggest in the center and go to zero out at the sides so you'd have current flowing around in X and Y, and then current flowing along, out and back in, along the Z axis. All right, so now we can take these and we can calculate the magnitude JS squared on the various surfaces. So on the sides, we said, that's this guy right here. So we just take the magnitude squared of that. Of course, the factor, the minus sign, the j, and the e to the minus j beta z all go away. So this becomes just magnitude e m squared pi over eta beta a squared. And what would be the little bit of surface area? Well, on the side, your ds would be x is fixed, so it would just be dy dz we take this times dy dz and we'd integrate that over from zero to b along the whole length of the side and we would keep the dz and that would then give us a power contribution when we multiply by uh, one half the uh, surface resistance and double it because we've got the same contribution over on the right that would give us a contribution of rs magnitude em squared pi over eta beta a squared b from the integral from zero to b times dz On the top and bottom, a little more complicated, magnitude of JS squared, it has Z and X components. So that works out to be magnitude EM squared. Um, and then we get in the first term, one over Z squared, sine squared pi over AX. And from the second term, we get pi over eta 
beta a squared has to factor right there times the cosine squared. And so you have to integrate that from zero to a in x. And so the little bit of surface element there would be a y is constant. So ds would be dx dz. And so we'd integrate that dx dz and use the fact that the average value of the sine squared and cosine squared is a half. Double that integral because you got the top and bottom and then take a factor of a half times the surface resistance and that gets you a contribution of RS magnitude of EM squared one over Z squared plus I over eta beta A squared times A over two EZ. And so you can combine those all together to get rate of change of the dissipated power per unit distance along the z-axis, dividing everything by dz. Putting those two together, you get rs magnitude em squared times um, and combining these, we got a factor here, right up here with this pi over a to beta a squared with a b, and here with an a over two, and we can write that as b plus a over two times pi over a to beta a squared, and then we've got this factor here with an a over two, so we'll write that as a over two z squared. And that would be then our expression for the rate of power loss per uh, unit distance traveled along the z-axis.